Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys. Say, kill all the boys. In and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. Based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance, Harold's brutal action, shout brutal action, fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. And then John's reflection. 1 John chapter 1. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. Listen, we saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life, this one who is life itself. Shout, who is life itself. Say it. Life Was revealed to us and we have seen him and now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. Shout, he is eternal life. He, life. he was with the Father and then he was revealed to us. And everyone said amen. amen. Please be seated. God, work a miracle now. Transform our lives and our thinking today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hope. Shout hope. hope. A hope that cannot be extinguished. It cannot be put out. Let me remind you today that behind the scenes of Santa Claus and Rid off, Rid 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 off, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, thank you, and chestnuts roasting on an open fire, and behind the celebrative songs that go from jingle bells to silver bells to silent night, that behind all of that, behind the, the $830 that the average American family is going to spend on Christmas this year, and 75% of us will go deeper into debt spending it, this, behind all of that is a birth. It's a birth. Galatians 4, 4 puts it this way, that when the time was right, God sent his son to be born of a woman. That, that Christmas is about the birth of a life that has changed the course of history and I argue is relevant to us. And the teaching of scripture is that this one who is born... Scripture declares he is the hope of glory. And he is, through his life and death and resurrection, a hope that can never be destroyed. Not with terrorist attacks, not with disease. Cannot be destroyed. Somebody shout hope. Here's an acronym that, that I uh, ran across that helps me to think about the meaning of hope. It says, hope is, 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 is uh, holding on to positive expectations. When everything in your life tells you to let go, to give up, hope is holding on to positive expectation. When everything around you says, forget it, give up, hope is Believing that something good is going to happen. Despite the evidence. Somebody shout hope. Now, I've picked these two passages to reflect on Christmas because they intersect with Christmas, at least the Christmas story, from a, an unusual perspective. 
Most times when we think of and read the Christmas stories in Matthew and in Luke, the Gospels, oftentimes it, it really is uh, about how they make us feel. And to a large extent, that's kind of, if I might use the word, the, the miracle of Christmas, if you will, or what some folk call the magic of Christmas. It's really, for a lot of people, it's about how it makes us feel. The songs, the wrapping of paper, of gifts, the movies, It's a Wonderful Life, Love Actually. <laughs> How it makes us feel. Reading Twas the Night Before Christmas when all in the house. But John says in 1 John that while it's great to feel a certain way about Christmas and the babe was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. While it's great to feel a certain way about the stories of Christmas, the angels surrounded the shepherds and declared peace on earth, goodwill towards all men. John says while it's great to feel a wonderful way about these stories of Christmas and the songs of Christmas, that at the end of the day, what John wants us to do is not feel a certain way, but he wants us to think about what they mean. Because part of the challenge with Christmas is that we, we don't always feel celebrative and joyful. And at the end of the day, salvation and the message of Christmas is not about a feeling. It's about what we believe. Let me drive it home this way. Last weekend, uh, as you know, I celebrated my 51st fifth first birthday. And a number of you really uh, picked up on the clue that I subtly gave you, which was to say that you were supposed to see me out there somewhere and say, wow, you really look good for 51. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and later that week, my uh, staff, best staff on the planet, uh, surprised me with, and this is not hyperbole, with what I am convinced was the best birthday party of my life. All right, let me describe it to you. It was a soul food birthday party. <laughs> it was. It's, it's, listen, let me tell you what we had. We had catfish. We had barbecue ribs. We had collard greens. We had jambalaya. We had uh, cornbread muffins. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we had this thing. I, I, I forget the name of it, but it, let me tell you. I'm going to describe it to you. It was, it's wrapped in a burrito, you know, the thing that comes with the burrito, the outside the burrito thing. What do you call that thing? And then, what is it called? Tortilla? Yes. So it was wrapped in a tortilla. And in the tortilla tier is uh, fried chicken, uh, 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 greens, collard greens, and what was it? Uh, 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 what is it? Macaroni and cheese, thank you. <laughs> that was bad, boy. That was bad. That was bad. Wait, 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 wait. To top it off, to top it off, to top it off, we had uh, some peach cobbler. Freshly baked. And then the staff had the nerve. <laughs> While I'm eating and partaking of all this amazing food to allow me, since it was a soul food party, to listen to Stevie Wonder and The Temptation and Marvin Gaye. Somebody shout awesome! And then they gave me what I am convinced and again, not hyperbole, I'm just telling you, I'm telling the truth. The absolutely best Christmas gifts that I have ever received, and I've received some pretty nice Christmas gifts over the years. Let me describe them. 
And they gave me two photo albums that were packed with uh, pictures and one-page letters that the staff and some of our key leaders wrote expressing their love and appreciation for me. Two photo albums. It was amazing. Best staff on the planet. And like that baby, that was my experience. <laughs> ah, it was good. Food was really good. The challenge that came with the party, though, was that I could only engage it with about 20% of me. Because the other 80% of me was just numb. And some of you know my wife and I have lost her father and my father-in-law. We just buried him the week before. And the grief and the pain that surrounds that experience for me has left me numb. So here I was at the best birthday party of my life full and overflowing with love and I couldn't feel it because I was numb isn't that the story that many of us quietly have about Christmas. It's the parents who grieve the loss of their child every Christmas. It's the partner who's going through a divorce right now. It's the, it's the person who is a vet who returns from Afghanistan three, four years ago, one of our heroes, our hero, and he can't walk through the malls, you know, because, because in his world in Afghanistan, if there was a lot of noise, it meant that somebody, immediately after that, somebody's going to walk up and pull a cord and blow themselves up. And whenever he walks through a, a crowd like that with all of that noise, it petrifies him. It traumatizes him. Amidst the joy and the celebration, the person who is struggling with clinical depression even though Christmas is a party that God has thrown for each of us, so many of us can't access it because we can't feel it. We go to parties at our job and all that, but we can't. We want to feel it, but our feelings just won't let us. So what was powerful for me in that moment, while I couldn't feel it, here's John's point. This is what John means when he says, this is what John means when he says, for we proclaim the one who existed before, beginning, before the beginning, who we have heard and we have seen and we, we've seen him with our own eyes. We've touched him with our own hands. This John is making the point that, that the birth of Jesus moves us beyond feelings because at the end of the day, I couldn't feel the love in that room. But I, I, I knew it was there. I could believe it was there because it was, I could taste it in the food. Come on. I, 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 I knew it was there. I could see it on the, on the smiles of the people that was in the room. I could see it in the hours that they had laid. I couldn't feel it, but I could believe it. I could believe it. And what John is saying with this text is that, that there's some stuff about it. And he's writing to a community that's having trouble feeling it. And he said you, that, that, that Christmas is not about ultimately your feelings. It's about a birth. 
And that that birth has changed the dynamic and trajectory of history. And that birth anchors all of life with a hope that cannot be destroyed. That's what John says. All right. Let's look at this. First of all, everybody say the environment. This hope, this ability to hold on to positive expectation. You know, that's, that was, that was, that's what I had in that room because, you know, I couldn't feel it, but I knew it. And part of what I knew in that birthday party was that the hope that sustained me in that room, the hope said to me, Herman, keep living. You will one day feel again. Hold on to positive expectation. And everything around you say you should let go. This is what John is. So, first of all, the environment. Everybody shout the environment. You cannot miss the environment that Jesus is born in. That is what this Matthew text. It is not an environment of Christmas lights and Christmas trees. It is not an environment of uh, uh, chestnuts roasting on the open fire. It is not an environment of silver barrels and, and, and jingle bells. It is a silent night, but actually it's not a silent night. No, it's not. The environment in which he born is there's a despot that's known for killing people, his relatives and folk who are close. This despot named Herod, and when he could not find Jesus, he decided, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna wipe people out uh, in a broad and brutal way. And so he sent soldiers into Bethlehem and around the region of Bethlehem, and every two-year-old child or younger. They would rush into the house, they would take their swords, they would snatch the child from their mama, and they would ram the sword through and leave the bleeding body in the home and in the streets. And so the text declares that what is, is, it's not a silent night. It is a night where there is weeping and great mourning. And Rachel, who is the, 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 the matriarch of the Israel, of the nation of Israel, uh, Rachel uh, symbolizes mothers from far and near who are just, who are unconsolable. Because their two-year-old or younger has been murdered. Doesn't that sound like San Bernardino? Fourteen innocent people, hospital, around disabled folk, innocently murdered. Doesn't that environment that Jesus was born in sound like Paris? Three, four different places across the city, hundreds of folk wounded, 135 or more folk murdered innocently out of a mad place of madness. Doesn't, doesn't that sound like Kenya in April where these madmen rush into this university campus and when it's all over after a day of seas, 135 people are dead. So here is the message of Christmas. It's, it's, it's a powerful message if you put it in the context. Listen, because when you read John, 1 John chapter 1, I encourage you to go home and read chapter 1 of the gospel of John, right? You've already read it a few months ago. Go back and read the first 14 verses. Just reflect on that and, and what we're studying today. And you'll find that there's some parallel words. Watch it. You'll find that in both places, you'll find that there's a discussion about about, about death and life. There is a discussion about light and darkness. There is a discussion about love and hate. And what the text is arguing is that Jesus was born into an environment of darkness and of, 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 of death. And of hatred. But when Jesus was born. Come on now. It was an announcement to the world. That God 
cares. He cares enough to not hold you at arm's length and say, I've got to stay far enough from you because I don't want the ugliness to mess me up. But he cares enough for you to show up in the environment of darkness and death and disease to be right there with you. Yes. Let me say a very quick thing here. You know, the Gospel of John, through chapter 3, verse 16, here's what it says. It talks about this as a, an announcement of love. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. That's good news. Shout gospel. That's Christmas there. That's Christmas right there, all right? But then there's 1 John, the book that we're in, chapter 3, verse 16 also. But it says this, but this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's Easter. And you can't fully understand Christmas until you've walked with the one born through Easter. Brutally killed out of the religion gone wild. But on the third day, he rises. And John says, that one, that one, that one, John says, it's real. He's not a legend. John says, that one, that one says that we have seen him with our own eyes. We have touched him with our own hands. He says, that one, that one, he's life itself. That one, that one is eternal life. That one, that one, he's everything that you've heard that he is. And, 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 and really they're using uh, Hebrew legal language here. So really it's like they're saying, I'm swearing a deposition on, 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 on my life. I'm telling you, it's real. Which means that with the birth of Jesus, here's the announcement. Yes, there's darkness in the world, but light will win. Here's the announcement. Yes, there's death in the world and in your life, but if you know he who is eternal life, life will win. Here's the announcement. Here's the announcement. Yes. There is hatred in the world, in your relationships, and in the community around you. But if you know he who is the source of life, come on now, love will win. All right, all right, all right, let me just share this. I read this last night, CNN News. It was ironic. Here's what the article says. America, Air Force is running out of bombs. Go look it up. Everybody's shocked. We're, we've dropped so many bombs on ISIS that we're literally depleting our stockpile. Our bomb stockpiles are shrinking. And don't get me wrong, I'm not a pacifist. I agree with using our military to fight against evil. But here's the truth. There are not enough bombs in the world to destroy evil. Only love can do that. That's the message of Christmas. Of a birth. Of a death. Listen to how John, of a resurrection. Listen to how John talks about it. Listen to how John talks about it. John says, so I've talked about the environment. Say the environment. God loves us enough to go to extenuating circumstances to get to us, to be with us. Never underestimate the power of knowing that God is with you in your misery. By the way, I like to say Christmas is nothing less than Christ in the mess with us. That's it, right? Never underestimate the power of him. Quickly. My son, I think he's about five or six years old, Jonathan. I had to take him to the doctor to get his next set of immunization. Doctor left, the nurse came in with this big long needle. Jonathan was sitting up on the gurney and he was, became agitated, started crying, started f moving and fighting because that nurse had that, she was insensitive. She was, <laughs> 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 so 
So I'm trying to hold him, say, it's going to be all right, it's going to be all right, dad is here, it's going to be all right. But all, all he knows is he's watching that needle. And she's now, you know, coming and says, pull your sleeve up, and she's coming to him, and he's like, fine, no, you're not, and he's fine. And so finally it dawns on me, and I said, Jonathan, I said, Jonathan, I, I said, look at me. And he looks at me, and he looks at me for a moment, and then he looks back at that needle, and he starts to cry and cry and cry. I said, Jonathan, look at me. And so he looks at me, and as he looks at me, I said, look at me. He's looking at me, tears are coming down. So I said, look at me. And then, and then, and then she, she puts that needle in his arm and he screams. I said, look at me. And he looks at me. And then finally, we both survive it. <laughs> Never underestimate the power of knowing that the father of eternity is in the situation with you. And while he's not the author of evil, while he's not the author of the pain, he says, I love you enough. I show up here and I'm going to engage it with you. And while you're going through, look at me. I'm hope. Look at me. I promise victory. Look at me. We will survive it together. That's Christmas, y'all. That's Christmas. If I say the incarnation, As the environment gives us a message about the, about the fact that God loves us, he cares for us, the environment and Christmas in which he was born. But then there's the incarnation, it's a big fancy word. It really means what you find in Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 14. And John begins, the Gospel of John begins like this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that is made. In him is life. It means he's the source of it. And his life is the light of people. And then verse 14 it says, And the word became human. That's incarnation right there. And we beheld his glory. Very fresh insight here. You would think that when God is disclosed in humanity, it would cover his glory. But rather, Jesus, in a sense, becomes a filter. And, and, and through the presence of Jesus, the bright glory of God is revealed. Full of grace and truth. All right? So here's how First John talks about it. So when I talk about Jesus, I'm proclaiming the one, verse 1, I'm proclaiming the one who existed from the very beginning. Point number one, he's saying Jesus is eternal. There's no beginning, there's no ending. Peculiarly, sounds like God. Secondly, he says, uh, he says we've, we, we touched him. And then he says, this one, who is life itself. Meaning, Jesus is the source of life. In other words, he's God. All right. And then he says, he says, so we testify and we proclaim, we testify and proclaim that this one is eternal life. Didn't say he will give, he says he is eternal life, life that doesn't quit. All right, now here's one of the fascinating differences between uh, Christianity and other faiths. In every other faith, good religions out there, they say there's a sage or a prophet that says you got to do this, this, and this in order to get eternal life. You got to find these various paths in order to get eternal life. Christmas reveals a God that says, in the person of Jesus, if you have me, you have eternal life. Not what you do, but who you have. Not how you feel, but who you have. See, I had my staff, and I had love. I didn't feel it, but it was still real. We'll give you another quick doctrine word, and I'm almost finished. 
Tim Keller points this out. It's a brilliant point that he makes. I give him credit for it, at least the first time. <clears throat> he says, no doubt there are people who say in the world that I'm not religious. I have no doctrine. Basically, they go on to say, my, I, what I think is that my job is just to live a good life. I'm just trying to live as, as good of a life as possible. And I think that if I can live a good life, it'll all work out in the end. And what, what Tim Keller points out is for you who say that's your position, that is doctrine. It's called salvation by works. It's your way of saying, I don't need a savior. I'm not that bad. And either you become super arrogant, which is pretty bad, or you become super cynical. But really, the fact that Christmas exists and Jesus comes in the world is an announcement we all need a Savior. Because we are all, not just the folk who fired those bullets in San Bernardino, we are all sinners so first so salvation by, now here's what gets me excited about salvation by grace now here, and here's what salvation by grace means that Jesus if I trust him he will save me in time and eternity watch it despite me he asks for my best but when my best doesn't measure up as it never will he will save me despite me. Now, this is important. Why? Because it's not just an announcement to me, it's an announcement to the world. What? That God declares, I'll save humanity in spite of humanity. Wow. That's great. Why? Because there's two great temptations in the face of escalating violence that we face. By the way, you thought you could hold it off, right? It happened in Kenya in April. That was on another continent. We felt bad. Turn the page. It happened in Paris in uh, September, it shook us up because we, we're close allies with them, but it's still across the waters. Turn the page. But last week it happened in San Bernardino. Now we run a great risk. What's the risk? Number one, of waking up in fear, saying maybe I can't leave my house, or maybe I can't walk down the street, or maybe I've got to be afraid of people of Middle Eastern descent. If they show up, I've got to start getting nervous. And But the gospel declares that if you know that if you've got Jesus, you've got eternal life, and that he gives you life not based on what you do, but based on who he is. Come on now. I don't have to worry about where I go. I don't have to worry about who I see because even if a tragedy happens, I will triumph because in Christ, life wins. All right. Why is that important? Because it frees me to be an agent of courage and an agent of justice and an agent of, of a voice for truth regardless of who's in the room, y'all. Here's the second temptation. Here's the second temptation. If I don't know what I know about Jesus and Christmas, I'll be tempted to start hating people of Middle Eastern descent. I'll be tempted to start hating anyone who calls himself or herself a Muslim. Now, let me just point this inside out. It comes straight out of, I believe, the text. Listen. Some people say that those two folk who shot those people in San Bernardino were the void of love. I disagree. They had a six-month baby. I know they loved the baby. If you talk with them, they would tell you that they loved their understanding of God. They were married. I, I suspect they would say we love each other. I, it wasn't the emptiness of love. It was the absence of hope. Because remember the definition of hope is holding on to positive expectations. But it's when they reached the point that they had no other reason to have positive expectation against a four 
those who are not part of their way of thinking and that the only option was to murder and to kill. Look what happens when you're devoid of hope, baby. When you're devoid of hope, it means that you are now available to become full of cynicism and when you become full of cynicism darkness shows up and when darkness shows up come on now then comes some hate and when all that happens you get cold and when you get cold you can walk in and do some cold things that's why you can not afford to hate Christ says love defeats hate <laughs> put it another way if you hate, you'll be just like them. The message of Christmas says no reason to hate. But love in spite. Wow. Okay, let me finish here. I'm down to one minute and 50 seconds. <laughs> Are y'all following me? Okay. All right. I brought. We've touched him. He is life. He is eternal life. He is hope. This morning I woke up and I've been thinking about this, praying about this, working on this all night. And somewhere I had a revelation. So I told my wife to come here. I said, sweetheart, I need you to cut my fingernails. And she said, what? I said, no. <laughs> Cut my fingernails and I need to take it to church. <laughs> she says, oh my God. She says, she says, First she said, oh. And then she says, and so she cut them. I have them on this tape. This is my fingernail. Say fingernail. fingernail. <laughs> this is my finger. I want to talk about the fingernail just for a moment. <laughs> Let's, let's, for a moment, this is clearly my fingernails. I know that for a fact. But I'm going to slip over here in the shadows. Let's assume you don't see me because I'm in the shadows. Let's just talk about the fingernails. The fingernails, while they are independent of me, they could not exist without me. Fingernails, fingernails. If you would examine the fingernails, you would discover that within the fingernails is evidence that I exist. Because there's 7 billion plus people on the planet, but there's a DNA in the fingernails. And it has only one name on it, Herman Hamilton. And then if you know anything about the decay of fingernails and, 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 and that if you come across fingernails like this and if you examine it and you know the freshness of the fingernails, you would have to determine, I don't see him, but he must be around somewhere. Fingernails, fingernails. Here's what I'm suggesting. A lot of us, we will never say that we're far from God because we don't use God language. Here's what we say, we're far from love. We're far from joy. We're far from meaning. And we're in pursuit of joy. We're in pursuit of meaning. We're in pursuit of love. And, and here's my argument. If you find just a little bit, say a little bit. If you find just a little bit of love, if it's authentically love, come on now. It's, it has the evidence that there's more of it. But too often, we simply settle for the fingernail. It's the fingernail that keeps us up all night. It's the fingernail that makes us cry. It's the fingernail that makes us break off relationships. It's the fingernail that makes us work ourselves to death. It's the We're in pursuit of just the fingernail. Because we don't know that there's more. Christmas is when the author of the fingernail steps out of the shadows steps down in the circumstances of your life and he says 
let go of pursuing the fingernail. There's more than a fingernail that wants to love you. And wherever Jesus is in your life, there's a sign over his head that says, there's hope. Yeah. Hope for real love. Hope for real peace. Hope for triumph in the face of death. There's hope for humanity. Thanks be to God for Jesus. <laughs> Say amen. amen. Give God a hand praise. <laughs> Show me your connection card. Here's the deal. Some of you are settling for too little. You're pursuing the little fingernail of love. And Jesus says, come to me. And today, you've had a revelation. First John says, he revealed himself to us. And for somebody, you get it. What will anchor me in life and in death is Jesus, he who is eternal life, and I want him. The totality of him, not just a little bit. And so all you need to do on, your, on the card there is simply check, I, I want to commit to Jesus today. I, I want him in my life. Or I'm not ready to make a commitment, but I want more information. Just check it. Turn it in, we'll follow up. For some of the rest of you, as you were listening to me, you were thinking about, one, the value of hope and the power of hope. And you were thinking about someone who should be here but is not here, who's living in hopelessness. And, and what I want you to do right now while you think about the person, I just want you to write their name down under the response to the message. And here's what I want you to do. Turn that card in. And we have 100 plus people who are going to be praying for them over the course of the next week or two. And I want you to pray for them. But then I want you to do one more thing. I want you to invite them to come hang out with you here for the next few weeks. And just maybe the miracle, the real miracle Christmas, hope will be born in their lives. Amen.